I think Dragon Age the Veil God could be really good. I say could because, as is always the case with hands-on previews, I played a curated selection of the game that may not be representative of the final experience overall. Having said that, what I played accounted for around 6 hours of gameplay taken primarily from the first act, and it was an encouraging sign of what could be in store for Dragon Age fans who have been waiting 10 long years for the follow-up to Inquisition. There's a feeling of confidence in everything the Veil God seems to do. You could argue that comes from the lengthy development time, a significant portion of which was no doubt dedicated to refining and polishing, but to me it was also indicative of a Bioware that feels anchored and in control again, that has a firm grasp on what it is and what its games should be. That confidence is evident from the very outset, where Varric recounts his relationship and history with former companion turned antagonist Solus, the Dread Wolf, an ancient elven god of lies, or heroic rebel depending on who you ask. Inquisition's iconic tarot card inspired art style returns to illustrate Varric's tale, and the sharp but personable nature of the intro's writing made for an elegant recap of the events leading to this point. And that, Varric says, is where you come in. As Rook, the soon to be leader of a search party that has tracked Solus to Minrathus, the capital of the Tevinta Imperium, you're asked with locating a local expert in a CD bar. We join as Rook and Varric demand the location of Nev Gallus from an incredulous bartender who is a little taken aback by you traipsing in and making demands. At that point, the classic radio menu pops up and offers me a choice between being cordial, threatening, or skipping to the violence and beating down the entire room. I chose the threatening option, and although things escalated pretty quickly, I learned that Nev had been taken to Dumat Plaza by venatory cultists, and Varric learned that my rook likes actions more than words. From there I was let loose in the streets of Minrathus, which was immediately one of the most striking locations I've seen in a Dragon Age game. This is the second time I've seen this location, and I still find it to be visually arresting, especially for Dragon Age. Previous games have looked good in their own ways, but Veilguard has more of a flair to its aesthetic. It's cleaner but also uses vibrant colours, a nice change from the dusty palette of Inquisition. All of it also has an otherworldly and magical feel to it. Minrathus, for example, is unmistakably a metropolitan city with towering buildings, illuminated shop signs and bustling streets, but the ordinary is given a fantastical twist. The people, meanwhile, live under the watchful eye of the Archon's palace, an ominous structure floating in the sky from which spotlights beam down on the city below, giving the place a distinctly authoritarian vibe, typical of the Tevinter Imperium. Though it may be a cliché, Minrathus has a strong sense of place and identity, which carries through to many of the other locations I saw, be it crumbling elven ruins reclaimed by nature, or the lighthouse, a kind of home base that exists in the Fade, which is a metaphysical realm of primeval matter. Look who's with us. We're, uh, we're really in the Fade. Dragon Age the Velgard takes players to new parts of the world, some of which have been alluded to in previous games, books or comics, while others are completely new. Either way, Bioware is taking the opportunity to flex its creative muscles and create environments that are vivid and memorable, to redefine what the world of Dragon Age can look like. Before long, my party of three was desperately fighting its way through Minrathus, felling demons, navigating precarious catwalks to get across the city, battling cultists and evading capture all while the city around us was being torn apart. It was surprisingly overwhelming for an opening of an RPG. Throwing the player into the thick of things is something that another Bioware game is notable and beloved for doing, Mass Effect 2. More importantly, it's a far cry from Dragon Age Inquisition, which effectively trapped players in a forgettable location to do a series of tedious recruitment missions and dull fetch quests. And much like the start of Mass Effect 2, I had this feeling while playing through the opening of the Veil Guard that I was about to experience something special. While I can't commit to saying that the Veil Guard will match Mass Effect 2's quality, I felt something akin to the same excitement playing Mass Effect 2 during my hands-on. And the whole world is going to look a lot like this. Later in the preview, I navigated through some ruins to find an Illuvian, effectively a doorway to another place that Solus has been utilising to get around. It took me to the Arlathan Forest, where I found Solus conducting a ritual by generating so much power that it made the land around him tremor. In the deciding moment, Varric announced that he was going to approach Solus and attempt to reason with him, to present him with another option other than the one he believes will undo his mistakes. It's a risky gambit that ultimately was my call to pursue. I could choose to tell Varric that his plan was a mistake or to believe and trust in him. 
An easy lightweight decision to get the old play your way gears rolling, I thought. I opted to let the power of friendship guide us, which devastatingly earned Lace Harding's disapproval. Varric reunites with his former friend, and the way it played out was the perfect encapsulation of what Bioware does best. Use choice and consequence, strong writing, memorable performances, and a little bit of emotional manipulation to make players feel like the author of their own story, as opposed to the agent of another's. There were multiple moments like these, which I won't spoil, but they were the strongest indication that Bioware was on the right track, and the gutsy high octane execution felt like a statement that they know it too. That moment was the game recalling a deeply personal connection between the player and the characters and between the characters themselves and leveraging all that for an impactful storytelling moment. Dragon Age 2, though it may not hold the highest regard among fans, has clearly been a major influence when it comes to the pacing and intensity of the combat. In many cases, combat can feel like a means to an end, the thing you need to do to get to the conversations and the decision making moments. But in my time with Belgard, combat was the thing I most wanted to engage with. Although pulling up a radio menu and selecting abilities for companions is an important part of the combat system, overall I felt it leaned more in the direction of an action game. This is largely to the game's responsiveness and speed. I opted to play as Rogue, so I was running around with dual blades, chaining light attacks together and swiftly cutting down enemies. It felt more like an action game due to the slight stickiness in targeting enemies and exaggerated movements to close the distance between Rook and the enemy. While it's not quite Batman gliding across a prison courtyard to clock a goon in the chin, it does have that sense of effortlessness when moving around the battlefield. When I wasn't on the offense, I was making use of my dash to get out of the way of incoming attacks and space myself better, or taking damage by holding my ground and blocking. Much to my pleasure, there's also a parry mechanic that requires precise timing and, should you pull it off, the enemy is slowed and you have an opening to counteract. The real juice, however, is in the abilities and specializations. As a rogue, my attacks generated momentum when they are interrupted. That can be spent on abilities such as Static Strikes, which fires two bolts of lightning that travel forward and deal damage independently. I could quick fire my bow to apply pressure to enemies or hold down the trigger on the controller for a more precise shot that does extra damage. Both provided me with good and reliable ranged options, since arrows automatically replenish over time. Each class also has specializations that they can spec into to unlock further combat depth. The rogue, for example, can pick between duelist, which excels in close quarters combat by chaining together blows and dancing around the battlefield, saboteur, a swashbuckler that uses explosives and other gadgets to hurt enemies or exert control over the battlefield, or veil ranger, which is focused on doing long range charge shots that are precise and powerful. While some of the unlocks under these specializations are stat boosts and buffs, others can be game changing abilities that make a character play completely different than what you'd expect and can make for some creative combinations with companions. The specializations feel like classes unto themselves, and I was eager to figure out the places I could take them when factoring in weapons and armor, which can also impact playstyles meaningfully. And there's so much more to the Veil Guard. The Lighthouse, where you can spend time with other characters and deepen bonds while also getting more insight to the history of Solus. Elaborate side quests that unlock new areas of Thedas to explore, and can reveal new sides to companions that they hadn't shown, and of course, there's the ability to flirt with anyone, and everyone this time. You can woo them with gifts, or watch them fall in love with each other while you go about your business. On paper, it can seem like the Veil Guard might be doing too much, but in what I played, there was a focus and cohesion between everything. Nothing felt superfluous. It all goes back to that sense of confidence that I mentioned. Dragon Age Inquisition is a game I love, but can also recognize as being very messy, often poorly paced and occasionally a bit of a bore to play. The disparate ideas and uneven execution made me feel like it didn't have a clear direction. Veilguard, from what I played, came across as the complete opposite, a game that looks to have found a strong identity, established clear objectives, and built around the core principles that elevated Bioware to the top of the role-playing genre. I came away from my hands-on with Dragon Age the Veilguard desperate to play more, thinking to myself, Bioware might be back. As for what the game could mean for the future of the studio and its other projects, that remains unknown, but its developers said their priority was honoring Dragon Age's legacy above all else.